Uh, at Creation Today, we really do believe that you can have answers. And we say it like this, you can have answers and you should. See, if you're confused, you're going to lose. And the people around you are going to lose. But it doesn't have to be that way. You really can have the answers. You can know the truth. And we say you should because many times someone's eternity is at stake. And eternity is just way too long to be wrong. So we really do want you to have the answers for why you believe what you believe. In life, there are four basic questions. We talk about this all the time. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going when I die? And the way you answer these questions depends on your worldview. We're going to be teaching tonight from a biblical worldview, from a position that says God's word is absolutely true. You can believe this book from cover to cover. And uh, I know for some people on here, you're going to say, but Eric, you're not doing that. You don't believe the verses that the Bible said, where the Bible says the earth is flat. We're going to be talking about that tonight. Ultimately, though, this is going to be my big question. As we get into flat earth, we'll talk about that. We'll debunk that. What am I going to do while I live? What are you doing right now that's going to matter for the glory of God? And I guess I just find myself going, I I pray you get busy doing something that's going to matter for God's glory, because that's the only thing that matters at the end is what we've done for the glory of God. Well, I've got Dr. Danny Faulkner on here with me. Uh, I'm going to ask him to start his video, start his audio and I'm looking forward to a fantastic evening of, of presentation and then slash uh, difficult questions, things that some of you have asked. Maybe you were on my Facebook page and you asked some of these questions. So, Dr. Faulkner, thanks for hanging out with me tonight, buddy. I appreciate it. Oh, it's good to be here. You are a writer, researcher, uh, jokester. Uh, 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 you do all kinds of stuff there at Answers in Genesis. And you're known for taking your bear around and getting pictures with your bear on your social media feeds. He's here tonight. Well, you brought your, uh, he's right there in the background. Would you look right past his head? Well, not to outdo you, Doc, but I brought mine here with me tonight. Oh, so, I see. That's a big bear. Uh, that's, this is a big old teddy bear. Brought mine What's his name? Here with me tonight. I, I had that one up you somehow. Uh, uh, okay. My bear is bigger, so. What, 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 what's your bear's name? Well, we're not that far along in the relationship yet to, to actually give it a name. Yeah, T- Teddy and I have been together for 63 years, so I've got another lead on you on that one. So No, you have not. Yeah, I, I got him for Christmas in 1958. So. Whoa! Well, Actually, uh, 50, 57, I'm sorry, 50, 50. 56 or 50, I'll just check the timeline. It was in the 50s. I was two years old. So, okay, so old obviously I, I am closer to the millennials because this is a very surface level relationship. I don't really care. Uh, so <laughs> it's amazing. I had no idea that that was the history of why you get the pictures with the bear. And you, you guys got to go check out his social media, uh, Danny Faulkner on, on uh, Facebook and you'll enjoy, you'll enjoy his post. So talking about flat earth tonight, you are an official astronomer. Yeah. You study the stars. Yeah. I've <laughs> been doing it all and my life. What got you interested in astronomy? I cannot remember a time I was not fascinated with astronomy. Uh, going back to um, when I, before I started school, uh, I was probably age four, sitting on the front stoop of our house, looking up at the stars at night and being fascinated. So um, I, I, I think I'm, I'm doing exactly what I was made to do to share God's glory through his creation, the creation of the, of the heavens. Um, I've just always been focused on that my entire life. It's been my passion since my earliest, earliest youth. So it wasn't until I was a sophomore in high school that I figured out that's what I needed to do with my life. But uh, uh, it's, a, it's a lifelong thing. That's really neat. For those of you that have seen one of Dr. Faulkner's presentations, you know it really does do that. It brings out the glory of God. Uh, as we consider the heavens, as David said. I often wonder, and maybe you studied this out more than I have, for David to say the things that he said about the glory of God by viewing the heavens, and then to realize what we have access to today with our technology, I just go, how, how, how much did he see in that versus what we see in it? And he, he got it. It was clear. Well, well, he had an advantage over us. Uh, he didn't have uh, lights like we have today and electricity. Things to keep him inside at night. Uh, he, as a shepherd, he was probably outside in the field from time to time. 
and the, and the, Judea, the Judean foothills, you're talking two or 3,000 feet above sea level in a Mediterranean climate. The, I'm sure the sky in the summer was incredible. Very few people today have seen the sky the way God intended you to see it. I've been privileged to be in some very dark, dry locations, and even I'm blown away when I'm there. It's a, a truly remarkable thing. And um, so he, he saw what he could see with the eyes, but uh, he also had the Lord in his heart, and that allowed him to, to pen Psalm 19. I think that must have been one of his early Psalms, <laughs> because I'm sure he was uh, really inspired when he was, when he was just a boy uh, there working uh, as a shepherd. That's neat. Well, I know many of you love astronomy. You love the study of the stars and the heavens, and I do find it um, awe-inspiring when you look at the size and the scope and whether it's, you know, that video that came out years ago that's, you know, starts at Earth and goes all the way out and backs out. The power of 10, I think it was called, right? 10 times, 10 times, 10 times. And just all of that is just almost more than the mind can handle. And it just, it really does make you, uh, it, it, it's just, you, you should be left in awe. At, at what God has done, at what the Creator has done. Well, you're the author of a book called Falling Flat, uh, an excellent book. And for those of you that are on this webinar tonight, I'm going to give you a coupon code where you can get a discount if you choose to get this book. It's going to cover more than what we're going to have time to cover tonight, but a fantastic book. Why did you end up having to write this? I, me I remember, let me tell you real quick, tell a story real quick. I remember calling you with a friend of mine, and this was probably seven years ago and saying, hey, are, are, have you done anything on the flat earth? And you're like, you know, well, not much. And I remember talking to you about how big the movement had become. And you're like, well, I, I knew there was some stuff out there, but you started looking into it even more. And it's like, it took off several years ago and just kind of exploded. Um, so I remember talking to you about that. And you, you've, uh, you've done way more than me in the research and the, the expose of what's really happening ended up with a book. So how did that happen, all that come about? Well, it was about four and a half years ago. In a week's time, I had three different conversations with three different adults, all concerned about young people that they knew who had gotten into this. And that's when it really is February of 2016. And it really, for the first time, I thought there's something going on here. Now, looking back, uh, I saw hints of this probably nearly a decade ago. I, I know I was still at the university then. I left there seven and a half years ago. <clears throat> and, and probably this would have been eight and a half, nine years ago or more, somebody sent me a video and I thought, well, that's interesting. And I, and I kind of ignored it. And maybe a year later, I got another one. We had this conversation sometime between those. It wasn't until I had those three conversations that I realized something was going on. So I, I jumped out there and started looking. And I was amazed. The movement had been going on for maybe a year at that point. Uh, it really took off on social media. And at that point, when you entered Flat Earth into a, a Google search, you got probably a million hits, and you would have a hard time finding anything that was contrary to it. If you just simply searched the topic a few years ago on the internet, you would get nothing but, but sources promoting that the earth was flat. And so some people will hear about it, they'd look into it, and after they'd spend, you know, 87 hours looking at endless videos and such, they were getting 100% pro-flat earth stuff and nothing on the other side. That alarmed me. And uh, so I, I began delving into this, and I continue to study it, but uh, I've, um, I've read a number of books. There are several written in recent years, in the last five or 10 years. I've read several of those. There were a bunch of them written at the end of the 19th and early 20th century. I read several of those. So I've read a bunch of books on this. I've uh, perused websites. I've watched far more hours of YouTube videos about this than I would care to admit to. And uh, I've also gone to three Flat Earth International Conferences, the one in Raleigh, North Carolina. That was the first one. The second one was a year later in uh, Denver. And the third one was last November in Dallas. And I went there to you know, do my research, to hear directly from the speakers, to uh, interact with them. And I got to meet a number of them. And I might, might add that many of them I have a very good relationship with, believe it or not. And most of the people there couldn't have been nicer to me. They were very kind to me. And I wasn't trying to convert anybody. I would answer questions if they had them. But I would survey people, just ask them, uh, just an in, informal poll. I would ask them a number of questions because I was curious about the movement, how people think, you know, what caused them to, to think the earth is flat and so forth. So I've been trying to do my due diligence in, in researching this movement. 
That's all. And, and you have, and I think your book answers a lot of those. There was one that it did not answer that I want to ask you about later. Matter of fact, we've already got somebody in the Q&A that's asking about this one particular argument for the flat earth. I had, where's my phone here? I had these kind of comments come in on my Facebook page. So uh, from Facebook, this came in. The Bible is a flat earth book. You either accept it or you make the claim that God let the writers be ignorant. Then we can ask, what else did God let the writers be ignorant of? Maybe the bodily resurrection. I don't know if that scares you that you're not taking the Bible literally, and maybe we shouldn't take the bodily resurrection literally. Another commenter, Isaiah knows the difference between a ball and a circle. He uses both words. Toss, uh, the earth is tossed like a ball and then sits upon the circle of the earth. Um, what was the earth revolving around before the sun was created on day four? If the earth is a spinning ball, then what were the people of Babel thinking building a tower all the way into a heaven? Also, why would God even say that they wouldn't succeed, uh, or that they would succeed if he did not stop them? If the earth is a ball, then why could Satan show Yeshua all the kingdoms of the earth? They don't know about the curvature because they're saying he just saw it all at one time. So these are the kind of the comments coming in, and, uh, and I'm sure we'll have some great comments tonight, so I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, let's launch with uh, maybe a couple, uh, uh, let's go on the positive side first, a couple evidences that convince you as a scientist and an astronomer that, that what we actually have is we have a sphere uh, as an as a earth rather than some kind of flat square shape or flat sh circle shape two-dimensional object. Can you uh, give us a couple of those real quick? I want, and, and here's why, for those of you that are watching, I want you to be able to intellectually and honestly give people an answer for why you believe what you believe. I really don't want you to be confused. And I think there's a lot of, matter of fact, we're doing a conference, a webinar um, next week. Our, our webinar next week is called Bad Answers. Sometimes Christians give terrible answers and it, it really makes, it, it doesn't set God up for who he is. And it really makes Christianity look ignorant. And that's not what we're trying to do. So we really want you to have answers for why we believe what we believe. And uh, that's, uh, let's, let's jump in, Dr. Faulkner, on, on maybe one of the reasons that, that you're convinced it, it's, it's, it's scientifically, it's biblically, it's a globe. Yeah, I, I do, I do uh, credit uh, flat earthers for raising a, a, a real good epistemological question. You know, epistemology is the uh, study of, of knowledge. How do we know what we know? And uh, so much of our education, and I would agree with them on, on the criticism here, so much of our education is based upon memorization of dates and facts and things like this with no real assimilation of these things. In my education, the teaching at the university for many years, uh, I was very much interested in my students knowing why we know what we know, not so much what is true. The earth, okay, the earth is a globe, but how do you know it's a globe? I would ask that question to my students early on in my astronomy class. And I never could get a good answer out of people because they've been spoon fed this fact their entire lives, but most of them have never been convinced of it. And it goes back a half century when I uh, mentioned before, when I was a, a sophomore in high school, I decided this was my calling in life was astronomy. And, and, and as I did that, I, I took the approach. I said, well, you know, I really need to start, start from the very beginning. And I, I remember asking the question, how do I know, how do we know that the earth is a globe? I asked that question a half century ago. So it's a fair question to ask. Now, do you get the right answers? That's that's the problem. Uh, and uh, so one of the one of the best arguments, and I like to use ones that people can do for themselves, as I have done, and that's looking at the shape of the Earth's shadow during a uh, during a lunar eclipse. And I'll do a screen share here to show you uh, what I'm talking about. Here's a photograph of a um, of a lunar eclipse. I took this a year and a half ago. I used a telescope with the camera attached to it. I, it's about a twelve, a little over twelve second exposure. And the deepest part of the eclipse is at the bottom, where it's a darker color, it's lighter at the top, but there's no, it's, not, it's in completely in the umbra at this point, but the umbra, the dark shadow of the Earth is not entirely dark. The Earth's atmosphere uh, comes in and, and um, uh, keeps it, you know, a little bit of light coming in. So it's not totally dark. It's very dark, but not totally dark. Now we have a good understanding of what causes lunar eclipses. The, it's when the, the Earth passes between the sun and the moon. It's a shadow then falling upon the moon. Now, flat earthers are going to argue immediately that no, that's not true. Well, they say it's not true because in their model, what we call the Zetetic model, 
the Earth is a flat disk with a dome over top, and the sun or moon are always above it. But actually, there's abundant evidence that that is not the case. One of them being is the fact that we can measure the position of the sun in the sky pretty precisely. We can measure the position of the moon in the sky very precisely. And lunar eclipses only happen when the moon is totally opposite the sun in the sky, or you know, roughly that position. So if if the sun is in one direction and the moon is in the opposite direction, then the Earth must lie between them. And when the uh, uh, when the eclipse starts, here's a photograph I took a year and a half ago prior to the uh, totality, probably about a half hour or so out from totality. And you can see the shape of the shadow, whatever it is, falling on the moon. You can see it's a section of a circle. And uh, here I took another photograph after the eclipse, and it's... Uh, the moon moved from right to left to get there from uh, through that shadow, whatever it is. And you can see what the shape is. And in case you really don't see it, I can help you out. I can put a circle in there for you. <laughs> the, the Earth's shadow is a circle. And this argument is not new. Uh, the earliest time we know about it in the literature was uh, around 350 BC in a book called On the Heavens. Aristotle actually made this argument. He said the Earth is a sphere and he gave several reasons. This was one of them. And I have seen, I counted up a years ago, I think I've seen more than a dozen total lunar eclipses. I've seen several partial lunar eclipses. I don't, I'd have to really dig into that, probably at least 15, 18 or so. And uh, every time, every time the Earth's shadow, the shadow on the moon is a circle. And it's also only happens when the moon is opposite the sky uh, from the sun. So therefore, it's pretty clear there's a shadow falling. Now, around flat Earth, could cast a circular shadow if the orientation is correct. Uh, say, for instance, if the sun is below the, the, the Earth and it's midnight and the sun, moon's high up, it would do that. But at the, uh, when, if the Earth is, is in any other orientation, you're not going to get that. At this very eclipse, it was around midnight for me here in the eastern United States. But I had a friend in Hawaii at the time watching the same eclipse. And at that point, it was occurring at sunset. And if the Earth were flat and round, then it would have been casting a, a very non-circular shadow. But he saw the same shape I did. You see, the only shape that consistently casts a circular shadow is a ball, a globe, regardless of the orientation. Again, a disk can, can give a circular shadow, but only for certain orientations. We never see any other shape other than a circle. Now, flat earthers will argue that that, uh, that cosmology is wrong. There must be some other cause for lunar eclipses, and I ask them, well, what causes them? And they don't have an answer. Their answer is just basically, uh, I don't know what causes a lunar eclipse, but I know what doesn't cause it. Well, that's a belief statement. It's not science. It's not based on observation, not based upon data. It's a reassertion of what they already want to believe. And again, there's abundant evidence that, that a lunar eclipse is indeed the Earth's shadow falling on it. So this, it's a very rigorous sort of argument for the Earth's, Earth's uh, shape being a sphere. Well, I like that one. I mean, at the end of the day, you're right. If so, is the argument from a flat Earth? Because I always thought they're they're. Uh, I get maybe how many flat Earth models are there? I've heard uh, you know you got the moon and the sun, and they're kind of going around like this. So that model, you'd have to have the sun underneath, with the uh, a a, yeah. a disc shape in between, and the moon up here. Well, the, the guy who uh, who started the flat Earth movement uh, was a man named uh, Samuel Robottom. He lived uh, in the 19th century in England. And he developed what he called the Zetetic model, Z-E-T-E-T-I-C. And the Zetetic model is the belief that the Earth is, excuse me, uh, is flat and round like this. Okay, it's flat and round, it's a disk. And we're on top of this disk, and there is a dome sitting over top of the Earth like this, a hemispherical dome. And uh, we're inside of it, and the stars are attached or in that, that dome. And the sun and the moon are either in that dome or below that dome, but they're a high up and, and, and they're encased in that dome. And this dome spins around once a day like this, and it carries the sun and the moon and the stars around in circles. And uh, that is the basic model. Uh, there are slight variations on that, but I've never heard any modern day flat earther opine any other, other model. Again, many of them will run run away from that, and they'll say, "Well, I don't know what I don't know what the model is. I don't know how how, how high the sun is or the moon is. I don't know how big they are." Um, so they they tend to many of them tend not to want to to um, flesh in any particular model, 
And uh, I, I think the reason for that is they realize as soon as they do, you can use that model to make predictions. And when you start comparing those predictions to reality, you find out that they fall far short. They don't match what we see at all. And again, this is the way science is supposed to work. Give me your model, give me your theory, make your predictions based upon your theory, and then we can talk about it. But they don't want to do that because they can't. The model doesn't work. So as soon as you give a specific model out of the different var varieties out there, because I've seen some that say, hey, it could be a square, and they use the four corners of the earth argument, but of course the Bible says circle. Um, so I've seen these different models, the dome, then the celestial dome around. I've seen, or, um, um, you know, over top. I've seen some different ones. And yet to me, the, there's just the, the concept of the sun being much smaller than what a heliocentric view says it is. What well, keeps it from burning up? Uh, is there a little skirt on it that makes it not shine over? I mean, if Satan could show Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, well, then why wouldn't the sun be shining on all the kingdoms of the world all the time in this flat earth model? It doesn't, it doesn't fit. But you're right. You make predictions and the predictions that we've seen, you did one recently uh, that looks pretty interesting that is, is once again confirms what we've seen. About the comment? Yeah, that's kind of no. cool. Well, uh, let, me back, let me back up a second. Um, flat earthers largely discount gravity. They say gravity does not exist. And part of the problem here is we use the word gravity two different ways. Uh, <clears throat> gravity is the word we use for the phenomenon that when you release objects, they fall downward. You know, whether that's all in parallel directions everywhere on a flat earth or whether it's towards the center of a spherical earth, it's just that phenomenon of things falling downward. So when people say, uh, you know, they, they, they really go ballistic with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and a few years ago when he was talking about flat earth, he said they, they deny gravity, he took the mic and he dropped the microphone. He said, that's gravity. And the people, you know, hold them in derision and laugh at him. Well, he was making a point. The way most people understand gravity, it is that propensity for things to fall downward, simply put. So are flat earthers denying that things fall downward? I don't think so. Uh, they, they all agree that happens. What they really mean is they don't believe any of the, the scientific theories we have about gravity. One of them, and the best one, really, I think, in many respects, is Newton's law of gravity. They don't think that, that that's true. But that's not the same thing as to say gravity doesn't exist. Gravity is real. You drop the mic, you drop anything, you can see something fall. So they're a little sloppy there. They should be saying, well, I don't believe in any uh, theory of gravity of, of Newton or of, or of Einstein, for that matter that they, they, they cloud the issue by that. Now, the point you're getting at is the fact that, uh, and I talk about this in my book a bit, how that uh, the, the theory of gravity was developed by Sir Isaac Newton 350 years ago, and it was not pie in the sky stuff. He actually was the first person to give a rational, reasonable explanation that, of what causes the moon's orbit, what causes the moon to go around the, around, the, around the earth every month. And then he applied that to the planets and found out that they followed the same pattern. It was amazing. His good friend, Sir Edmund Hawley, um, applied it to comets and found they follow the same orbit. We now have, have thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of asteroids that follow the same thing. And comets, there are over a thousand of those known. They follow the same thing. By the way, my expertise largely in, in astronomy is in binary stars. These are two stars, stars orbiting around each other. Guess what? Their motion conforms to what Newton said about gravity. We see this playing out again and again and again. So. Um, uh, let me let me show show what you share with one what you ask about there. Comet Neowise was discovered back in March, and uh, they, they were able to calculate a uh, an orbit for it. Now, an orbit requires five variables, five uh, constants worked out, and once you know those, and they got those very early on from observations of the position, it will tell you where where this where this comet will be any time in the future or in the past for that matter. So back three months ago, they could predict the position that this comet would have as a function of time. So I've gone out the last uh, week or so and taking photographs of this. On the left is a photograph I took on Ju July 8th, and on the right is the one I took on July 13th. That was this morning. This is like uh, 5 o'clock in the morning. And uh, I've got a picture of arrow pointing to the comet's location there on the uh, July 8th. And... Um, I've also got it pointed on July 13th. You can see the comet a little better this morning because it was a bit brighter and the sky was clear where I live. Now on the first uh, image, you'll see above the comet, there's a bright star and to the upper right, there's another star, not quite so bright. And notice they make a, a rather 
um, uh, narrow triangle, the, the two stars and the comet had. Well, if you look in the photograph on the right, that bright star is there and that lower right star is over there. And so you can see a tremendous amount of motion that's taken place over just five days. And over the past, uh, uh, since the eighth, I've observed it on five mornings and, uh, and it's, it's moved each day. And there's, there are finer charts out there based upon the orbital calculation and it matches exactly where it's supposed to be. Now this has played out many times. I've looked at dozens, probably scores of comets in my lifetime. I've looked at planets, I've looked at asteroids, I've looked at many things, and they're always exactly where we say they're going to be. And this is based upon the theory, Newton's theory of gravity. And the way things work in science, you make your predictions, and then you test your predictions. In this case, we're predicting the orbit, and then we go out and see where the where the thing is as a function of time, and sure enough, it matches. That's basic scientific method. And this is a very powerful uh, verification that Newton's law of gravity is real. If you're gonna deny that the law of gravity is real, then you're gonna to have to argue that, that this is all a tremendous coincidence. We calculate this on a horribly flawed model, and yet, son of a gun, it always comes out to be, to be what we would say would be on that model. And I've asked flat earthers, okay, can you give me, can you give me in the flat earth model any theory at all which would tell me the motion of this comet? And you get crickets because there is no theory. Can you predict for me what the position of the planets will be on your flat earth model? And there is no prediction. Can you predict for me where the moon will be as a function of time? There is no prediction. They're simply hand waving. They're not making any predictions at all. Meanwhile, ignoring the tremendous amount of predictions and verification we make countless times. This is a very well tested and very well proven sort of model. It's got a high level of scientific verification behind it. So, so it's it's silly to argue that that this is not true. And, and I, I never get a straight answer out of people out of flat earthers on this. They seem to think that it's just uh, all happenstance, I guess. That's interesting. What's another? Uh, you got the the whole idea of the eclipse. You got the comet that you can predict. We're making predictive uh, uh, measurements that are very precise, very accurate, and consistently coming true. Um, we've got the, I'm just kind of making some notes here, the circle eclipses on the moon, the lunar eclipses that happen. What are some more evidences that convince you we are on a globe? Kind of going back to when you ask your students, how do you know? How do you know the earth is round? It's a globe. How do you, how do you know? What are some other things that, that students should have thought have, should have thought of? Okay, I'll go back to uh, Aristotle once again on these things. Here was a photograph that uh, that a uh, a friend of mine took. Uh, he, he's, a, he's a he's a pastor friend, Jim Bonser from Iowa. He comes uh, usually to the uh, Ark and Museum at least once a year. Pastors conference. He's definitely here. So a couple of years ago, I got permission to go down to the Ark Encounter, and uh, at night, and we spent half a night down there, the two of us. We had to get the lights turned off. It's not like you um, have a single light switch someplace, a bunch of circuit breakers, and they had to go look for them. So it took them hours to find these things. I really appreciate the staff going the extra mile for us. And if you've been to the Ark Encounter, you'll recognize exactly where this photograph was taken. It's a little uh, uh, back from uh, in front of Imzara's uh, buffet, heading back towards the Answer Center. A very, very common place where people take photographs, except we were there at night. This is a half hour exposure. And you'll see all these circular patterns that are there. And at the center of this circular pattern is one little tiny uh, part of an arc there. It looks like a point almost, but it isn't. And that is the uh, path of Polaris or the North Star. Now, Polaris is within three quarters of a degree of what we call the North Celestial Pole. There's a spot in the sky around which all the stars appear to rotate uh, once a day, once a sidereal day, 23 hours and 56 minutes. So if you take a half hour exposure, you're going to get about 148th of one complete circle there. And the um, North Celestial Pole is there at the very center. And I can use the North Star as kind of a stand-in since it's within a degree of that point. It's, it's pretty good. Now, on the, what we observe is that the the angle that that point makes in the sky is equal to one's latitude. Here at the Ark Encounter, it's around 38 degrees, maybe 38 and a half degrees, something like this. It's a little less than halfway up, more than a third of the way up. You know, I was in Edinburgh, Scotland, a year and a half ago, and up there at the high northern latitude, I went out at night several nights and looked at the North Star, and it was almost two-thirds the way up towards the zenith, the point overhead. 
And then a few months later, I was visiting my sister in South Florida, and it wasn't even a third of the way up. It was only, you know, a little over a quarter of the way up in the sky. It was extremely low. And uh, it coincides very well with your latitude. If you measure that angle, you're going to find it's equal to your latitude. Now, this makes perfect sense on a spherical Earth. As it turns out, uh, it, if you, it's a nice little geometry proof you can go through here. That's exactly what you expect to see uh, if the Earth is spherical. As you travel northward, stars in the northern part of the sky are going to rise higher. Stars in the southern are going to disappear in the below the horizon. And as you um, go farther south, the reverse is true. Uh, one example I like to use is a star called Canopus. I could see it from South Carolina on winter evenings. Uh, I had a really good exposure to the south. Where I live here, I never see it because I'm too far north. There in Florida where you live, it's a lot easier to see in the wintertime. You know, if you go to the southern hemisphere, Canopus is high overhead, and the North Star is not visible at all. Uh, this works very easily and nicely on a spherical Earth. It, it's ex exactly what we expect to see. Uh, not at all what you expect to see in the Zetetic model. We can talk about that more about that later on. But uh, this one observation is impossible to explain in a Zetetic model. And some people who try end up trying to invoke all sorts of weird atmospheric effects for all sorts of things, including this. This is one of those things, again, you can test for yourself. You don't have to rely upon NASA. You don't have to trust me. You can out and do the experiment yourself. If you can find the North Star in the Northern Hemisphere and you travel, say, up to Michigan and down to Florida, make a note of where it appears in the sky. It, you'll be amazed. It matches exactly what we'd expect to see. That's awesome. And, and that really, I remember going down to uh, Peru and being able to see uh, the Southern Cross and things like that, stars that I had never seen up here, I was able to see down there. Yep, that's part of it too. All right, so we got uh, the, the, the lunar eclipse is always uh, spherical, and you would think uh, at some point it, it would, if it was somehow going underneath for some reason, underneath the earth and the moon, the sun was and the moon up here and it got in the way, at some point it would be at a slight angle enough to where it wouldn't be a perfect curve, and it's the same curvature every time. Yeah, every time we see a, it. would be an ellipse or a line or a, a rectangle. And it never is. It's always it's always a circular. And so again, the only shape that casts a circular shadow, regardless of orientation, is a sphere. And then the uh, going back to Aristotle, the very idea of the stars that we see in the direction they go, the exposure, where you move, you're expecting it to be a different angle, and that's all based on a spherical, uh, a, a globe model. What's another one? Well, Pliny the Elder in the first century uh, talked about departing ships, and I've always thought maybe. Uh, it was a little hard for him to see because to do this, you really need some optical aid. But he may have been standing there on some of the Greek, uh, some of the uh, some of the islands they had in the Mediterranean. If you stand on, on an island and you on, on the seashore and you look off at an island in the distance, you may not see much of it. But if you climb up higher on a, on a hillside, you can see more of it, or you may see islands you couldn't see otherwise. But I, I tested this for myself about three, four years ago. I happened to be in Virginia Beach. I don't live near the ocean, so I can't do this very often. But uh, if I come down sometime, maybe we can go out and spend a couple of days at the beach there watching ships there in Pensacola head out to sea. But they have a large port there at Newport News. So I'm going to show you another um, screen share here. I'm glad you're getting into this, by the way, because that is, this is something that I've heard uh, on multiple Flat Earth videos, the very idea that ships actually aren't disappearing whenever you, you yeah. uh, they, they, they We go can off. talk more about that if you'd like. Here is a, uh, the, one of the, I took a number of photos. I was there. I got there early afternoon and stayed really almost to sunset. Here's a, one ship heading out to sea. It already already passed out where I was. I wish I could have gotten there earlier in the day, but I couldn't. And you can see there they've got uh, the containers. I see two, four, about seven, seven or eight uh, stacks of, uh, of containers there stacked up that much above the deck. And you can see on the hull it says NKY line. That is, uh, or NYK line. That is a, a well-known Japanese shipping firm. You've, if you've seen ports at all, you know, container ships, you've seen some of their ships. They're, they're one of the biggest. And uh, the ships I've seen, those, uh, the, the, the lettering does not go down to the waterline. They're above the waterline. And uh, so when you look at this photograph I took, it uh, is, is um, partially blocked off already. And you have to ask yourself the question, well, what's blocking it off? Well, I think it's the curvature of the Earth that's doing that. This thing's already sailed out several miles. How far, I don't know exactly. Now, I, I will tell you, I was using a, a digital camera attached to a, a telescope that has a photo, focal length of nearly 1,400 millimeters. So it's a whale of a telephoto lens uh, that I'm using here. And um, 
I took some more pictures. I'll just show you a few here. They've got a little farther out. And now that you can tell it's farther out because the ship is obviously smaller. You can see the bridge castle there is, is smaller. And there's none of the, uh, none of the uh, hull is visible at all. It's completely blocked at that point. And again, where is it, where is it going? It's being blocked by something. There is a little bit of um, an inferior mirage there. As it turns out, there was a, a, a layer of slightly warmer air sitting on top of the water. We can talk about that a little more later on. And so there was a very, very feeble inferior mirage. And so you're seeing a little bit of reflection of the, uh, of the, uh, of the top of the deck there, that gray layer there. Later on, it disappeared. Over here, you have the ship is now turned. I think it's probably heading to Europe. It had cleared out of the bay at that point and was heading turn more to the east and north. So I'm seeing just the stern, and I'm seeing uh, the bridge castle there, obviously, the, uh, and I'm, I'm seeing the, the um, few of the containers. And finally, it got like this, and I'm not seeing any of the containers whatsoever. All I'm seeing is the bridge castle, and I'm seeing a little bit of that mirrored by the inferior mirage that you're getting there, the feeble as it was. And what I see here is very clear evidence that the, that the ship is indeed disappearing whole first, just as Pliny the Elder said that it should, and it, indeed that's the case. So uh, again, this is an argument that uh, anybody can do for themselves to show that the Earth is indeed a sphere. This is what you expect to happen on a spherical Earth, but not what you would expect to happen if the Earth is flat. Now again, flat Earthers, when confronted with this, oftentimes will make up all sorts of weird effects to try to explain this, uh, but they fall flat as it were. The reason people are actually able to see some things at long distances, though, uh, that has to do with, and I've read your articles on this, that has to do with the, the, the atmosphere and what's actually happening with light being bent and the way that's happening, whether it's a, uh, uh, what is it where the, the hot air is above and it actually reflects back down off of that hot air? Well, the condition I had was what, what you call a normal condition where the air is warmer <clears throat> at the surface. And you, people know from grade school science that the temperature of the air generally decreases with higher elevation. So as you go upward, the temperature of the air gets less and less cooler, much cooler higher up. Now, it does reverse at some point, but it's way, way up there. Uh, it's above the stratosphere where, actually, uh, where it actually reverses. But um, you can get a thing called a temperature inversion. This happens uh, over large bodies of water uh, frequently, particularly in the summer and in the spring. Uh, what happens there, you, you remember, may remember from grade school science that water is, is, uh, uh, has what we call a high specific heat. It takes a lot of um, heat addition to raise the temperature of water, a lot of heat extraction to cool it down. So in the, uh, on warm spring and summer days, the uh, large body of water, such as uh, Lake Michigan, let's say, or the ocean, uh, will oftentimes, almost every day, have uh, water that's cooler than the air. And so as you get into the uh, end of the daytime, that, uh, that uh, warmer air comes in contact with the cooler water and it chills that layer, layer of, of air in contact with the water. So here's the water. And then normally the temperature is warmest here. And as you rise upward, it, it gets low, less temperature. But when, they, when you have a, a layer of, of, of cool air sitting here in contact with the relatively cool water, you get this cool layer of air and then warmer air above that. That's called a temperature inversion. And again, that happens almost every warm spring and summer days. I didn't have that when I did my experiment because I did it in November on a cold day in November. Um, it was the water temperature, I looked it up, was 62 degrees. The air temperature was 50 when I started. It was 49 when by the time I finished as Fahrenheit. And uh, most people don't want to go to the beach on a day where it's 49 or 50. Do you ever go to the beach on those days, Eric? I'm an official Florida boy. I wait till it's warm enough, and then I go enjoy it. <laughs> well, see, see, 49 or 50 is not that bad for most of us, but the problem is it's always windy at the beach. So when you throw in a 10-mile-an-hour wind with that kind of temperature, it's downright cold on the beach. People don't go to the beach much in the winter and in the on cold autumn days uh, for good reason. Uh, so people go out on, on warm spring and summer days, and when they do, they get a temperature inversion, and something very different happens. The problem is on a, on a uh, well, let me show you what they, what they end up finding here. I got an illustration. This seems to be the, the big exhibit. I'm sure some flat earthers are already saying, hey, show, what about this? What about this? Okay, we'll talk about, about this. Um, this is a photograph of 
That's the one I was thinking of. Yeah. Uh, this is a photograph by uh, Joshua Nowicki, who, by the way, is not a flat earther. That's very important. He's a very good photographer. And uh, if you look there, you can see the uh, skyline of Chicago, this, the Willis Tower, uh, formerly, formerly the Sears Tower on the left, and a few other buildings you may recognize if you know Chicago very well. And uh, again, a nice view. Now, he took this uh, from Grand Mare State Park, and you may not know where that is. Flat Earthers certainly know. It's a, a state park in, in Michigan, the state of Michigan on the southwest uh, coast there, of, uh, it's about, it's over 50 miles from Chicago. And so when you see this photograph, you say, wait a minute, let's do the curvature uh, a, a, a calculation. You can calculate if the earth is a globe, 25,000 miles in circumference, then over 50 miles, there ought to be something like 1800 feet of curvature. So the entire Chicago skyline, including the tallest building should lie below that curvature. Yet there it sits. And they say, aha, this proves that the earth is flat. Now, many people find that a very compelling argument. Okay. But the problem is, if this is really evidence that the earth is flat, then would you not expect to see this on any clear day? Correct. And the fact is, you don't. You often see it on clear days in, in the spring and summer, but you rarely see them in the winter or cold autumn days. You don't see it. That ought to tell you something. <laughs> it ought to tell you something a lot. The conditions are not conducive at the time people generally aren't looking for it. Now, Joshua Noki, as I said, is not a flat earther, but he, he's a good photographer and he understands optics and he understands what is going on here. When you have a, a layer of, of, <clears throat> of warmer air, a cooler air in, in near the surface and warmer air above, if, a, if light starts taking off at a tangent from the Chicago skyline out across the lake, it will tend to, as it goes out tangent to the Earth's surface, it will the Earth curvature will drop below it, which means it will start to rise in the atmosphere and move on out into space. Well, the problem is the speed of, of light depends upon the temperature, and it's slower in warmer air, uh, cooler air, than it is in warmer air. So as it starts to move upward through the atmosphere, moving along that tangent over the curved Earth, it's encountering air that's at a warmer temperature. And this is causes refraction. This is something, if you've studied optics at all, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. And when you have a change in, in density like that, it tends to refract back into the denser medium. So it can't escape from this layer of, of cooler air. It bends continually for miles upon miles upon miles. And, and flat earthers just are flabbergasted to hear this. They just roll their eyes. They can't believe this is true. And they, 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 they think well, this is just crazy. Well, no, it's based on very well understood optics. Anybody that studied optics understands very well what's going on here. Joshua Nicky, what Nowicki does too. He only goes out and takes these photographs when he knows from the weather conditions, the water and air temperature, if a temperature inversion is present or likely to be present. And hence, if the sky is clear enough to get these marvelous sorts of photographs. Um, That's really cool. So you can't so, see that so, every day. And, and you've got some flat earthers that go out and do these experiments, but every time they do this and they say, well, what about this? I say, okay, when was this done? Where was this done? What was the air temperature and what was the water temperature? And, and, and it turns out they, they do it in the spring and summer. Go there on a cold autumn day, go there on a winter day and see if you see this. And the answer is you won't. I mean, nobody wants to go out on Lake Michigan when it's, when it's 10 degrees in January. The water temperature will be 32 because the water doesn't freeze down there. But nobody wants to go out on the lake when it's 10 degrees. I can understand that. But do your due diligence. You will not see the Chicago skyline from across Lake Michigan on a cold winter day like that. This won't happen. But on summer days, you're going to see it. So they're not, they're not really doing their due diligence like I have on this. Well, you certainly have. Um, by the way, your book, Falling Flat, covers this and way more. And we're going to give you guys an opportunity to get that at a discount. So I'm excited about that. Let me shift and transition from, okay, how do you know it's a globe to um, what are some of the real problems of the, in, in, the, the flat earth models, what we would expect to see versus what we see in the scientific fields? Well, I've already talked about some of those, but um, uh, some of the things you, you would encounter is um, uh, the sun rises and the sun sets every day. Uh, how does that happen? If you've got a, a disc sitting here like this, 
and the sun's moving around like this, you can see that it's always above the horizon. From any location on the flat Earth, you can, you can you draw a line between your location and the sun, because the sun's always up. So why is it that you have daylight and night, and why does the sun rise and set? Well, they, they try to argue that the daylight is caused by, uh, many of them will argue that the sun is like a, like a, like a searchlight. It's got a cone of light coming down like this. And as it spins around, it will shine on you, and then it won't shine on you. And again, they've got a little illustration. I can, I can show that if you would like to see that, They're showing that. Yeah, I've seen that. Okay, so they've got this little spotlight there, and they've shown the, uh, the North Pole as an axis there, and the, the uh, little dotted line shows the path that the sun follows. And so the little thing on the right, the left is a diagram, on the right shows a little model they have, and that little yellow thing with the light around it, that's the sun spinning around, and the moon is that one in the dark spot. So you're going daylight and dark, daylight and dark. However, the whole time the sun is always above the horizon. So why does it set? And they try to argue some, some flim flam about perspective. They're trying to say that, that well, the, the uh, sun is just, you know, as it moves away from us, gets farther away, it tends to, tends to go down to this convergent point on the horizon, which it doesn't, it can't within their model to do that. But let me just cut to the chase on this. Look, I can test this, I've tested it. Suppose that, uh, uh, if you're sitting there in, in the United States and notice that the sun comes around and it's night and now it's noon and it's noon and uh, as the sun is approaching noon and leaving noon, notice the sun is getting closer and in farther away. Closer and in farther away. So you would expect around local noon that the sun would be the, the, uh, as high in the, as, be as, as, as close to you as possible. And in the morning and in the afternoon, it would be farther away. So I tested this. What I did is I went out and I took a photograph of the sun when it's very early in the morning. I did this about three or four years ago now, I guess. I've done this many times, by the way. This is, this is the first time I actually did this to, for, for this particular experiment. And you'll see there uh, a picture of the sun. And uh, I, I used the same telescope I used before for the lunar eclipse. And the, uh, the, I set the, the uh, timing on this, the, uh, the exposure time and the ISO, and I kept it the same. The only thing that changed was where the sun was. And this is in the morning. I think the sun was about eight degrees up. You can see a tree branch there. I did this in the parking lot behind the um, Creation Museum, and that was the earliest in the day that I could actually see the sun above the trees. There's some trees off in the distance. So the sun's about eight degrees up, so it's very low in the sky. And then at local noon, a few hours later, I took the photograph again, the same exposure times, same ISO. Uh, I used a solar filter for both of these. You have to do that because the sun's so incredibly bright. And you'll notice it's much brighter and more yellow. That's because the uh, sun is, you know, when the sun is low in the sky, it's coming through more air, through a more atmosphere, and it looks dimmer. Anyway, I can see that in sunrise and sunset. The sun's pretty dim. It's pretty bright in the middle of the day. Now, if if the Zetetti model is correct, then the sun would be closest to us in that right photograph, and it would be farther away on that left photograph. And I, and I did the calculations just using basic trig and algebra. That's all I used. And uh, I calculated based on the Zetetti model. And by the way, it doesn't depend how high the sun is. Some people say it's 3,000 miles high and 32 miles across. Some will say it's only 2,000 miles, maybe 4,000 miles. It doesn't matter. It cancels out, as it turns out. And I calculated eight degrees and like 62 degrees altitude the sun had at, at local noon, the sun should have appeared 6.4 times larger than, than it did in the, in the first photograph. Clearly, they're the same size. I, I, I've not trained any, played any tricks here. I've, I've presented these at the same scale. I've printed them out I've, on paper. I've measured the diameters to the ability of the, of the printer to, to print it out evenly. They're the same size, within like a millimeter or so. Um, so there's no change in the size of the Earth. Now, if the Earth is in the Zetetic model, you must have that. It's a basic facts of, of, of mathematics, geometry, and so forth. You have to deny geometry in order to get this to, to happen. So uh, you can't explain sunrise and sunset. And you can't explain why the sun has the same size, apparent size, throughout the day. And the uh, conventional cosmology, the sun's distance changes by a few thousand miles out of, a few, uh, out of nearly 100 million miles. So you're not going to see any appreciable change in, in apparent size because the uh, the size the difference in distance it just doesn't matter. But in a synthetic model, it really does. I, I think that's great. I remember reading that in your book. And uh, see, and the number again was it should be ten times bigger by high noon versus early in the day because no, how much six, further? Six point four times larger. 
Six point four times. Now, now, if you if you if you looked at the sun right on the horizon, it would be like a hundred times larger. Uh, but I I couldn't do that because I have trees in the way. Well, oh, I see what you're saying. Based on how far you think how far it would be away, right. on yep. that model. Mm. Right. And the other thing the other thing is is that the the uh, if an object is is close to you, moving at a certain speed, then it will have a faster apparent motion when it's close to you. Imagine looking at a, standing on the side of the road and see a car drive by. It seems to zip by, but if you're standing a half mile away, it's creeping along. That, that's, they, the flat others like to talk perspective. This is a, a real effect of perspective. Objects moving along that are close to you move faster, appear to move faster than things farther away. So the sun should move very slowly in the morning and then it should speed up until noon, and then after that it should slow down again. That's again perspective. That's that's the reality of geometry. But um, I can put a clock drive on the the telescope. I have to do that to track it, and it tracks the uh, things at a rate of 15 degrees per hour, and it's a constant 15 degrees per hour. Again, the the, the static model can't explain that. Uh, they have to make up all sorts of flim flam to try to explain that when the conventional cosmology explains it very simply. So again, in a flat earth model, they're saying anywhere from 2,000 to 4,000 miles up is how high above the earth, the sun, and the uh, Well, I, I can't get that... any of them to commit to that. Uh, Robottom, in one of his books, said it was 3,000 miles and 32 miles across. But in another book, I think he said it's 4,200. Maybe that's uh, someone else I'm thinking of. But uh, over 100 years ago, there were various people trying to quantify that, and they gave up after a while. But I have not had any modern day flat earthers be able to specify a model. I've repeatedly asked them, how high up is the sun? And they won't tell me. What they will tell me is, uh, well, I don't know, but I know that it's not 93 million miles away. And that this gets me kind of a weird way that flat earthers look at the world. They, they tend to define the, uh, what they, in terms of what they don't believe as opposed to what they do believe. They, they can't tell me the causes of eclipses, but they can tell me what they think it is not. They yeah. can't tell me how far away the sun is, but they can tell me what they think it is not. And on and on it goes. They tell me what they don't believe in terms of, instead of what, what they do believe. It's kind of a negative way of looking at the world, I think. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's just a, a bad way to argue. I don't know what the truth is, but I know that's not it. How can you know that that's not it when you don't know what the truth is? Yeah. Well, they know one thing, they know the earth is flat. Everything else doesn't matter to them. And wow. uh, ideas have consequences. You can make predictions on things. And again and again and again, this fails. Okay, what about uh, another? So we got uh, the sun uh, and how big it would be, its apparent size and apparent speed as it came closer to you directly overhead in a flat earth model, it would start slow and then go yeah. fast uh, and then slow again as it went away from you. What's another one? Uh, we were talking about those ellipses and what the stars would okay. look like. Star, star trails. Sometimes, remember that photograph I showed of the, um, of the stars at the arc going in circles? And I've seen many flat Earth memes where they argue that oh, this can only happen on a flat Earth. It can't happen anywhere else. And uh, that is false as well. Remember what the model is. You've got a flat disk sitting here. And you've got this dome over top. And it spins around and acts as passing through the North Pole. The North Pole is at the center of the, of the Earth on this model. So you get stars going in circles like this. Now, if you're at the North Pole and you're looking up at a star going in a circle like that, it will look like this, all right? It yeah. will look like a circle. But if you're anywhere else, if you're off the axis, it will not look like that. It will look like this. It'll be an elliptical shape. Not that, but an elliptical shape. So when they put these, these diagram, these, these star, star trail figures, and they say, this can only happen on a flat Earth. That is false. It would only happen on a flat Earth if it happened to be at the uh, at the North Pole. Anywhere else, it's going to look like this. I had them uh, put the stars spinning around a point at the top of the dome, and I set my camera up some distance away from the center and got it high up as I could. And I opened up the shutter for for 30 seconds, and I took this exposure. And you can see the shape of the stars are ellips are ellipses. They're not they're not circles, right? The, the trails right. are definitely elliptical. Right. And that's because the, um, again, I'm viewing it off axis. At, on the North Pole of the Earth, there would be circles, but at the, uh, at, when you're off that axis, like I would be here in the United States, it, they're going to look like ellipses, but they don't look like that. That's a photograph I took in Arizona a few years ago. That's a half hour exposure, and you can see that they are circles. I've done some time-lapse videos. Can you see this time-lapse video? That's a cool one. I took this above my house. 
you see that star above the point of my house there? That's a North Star. And to the upper left, you can see the Big Dipper spinning around, can't you? That's and that's awesome. moving in a counterclockwise direction. I'll show that to you again. This is about a half hour. Uh, it's really about a little over an hour of exposures. I, I took a bunch of them, put them together to make this time lapse. I've been doing a lot of this the last uh, year and a half or so. I uh, took this one in Grand Canyon. This is showing this, uh, looking towards the south. The Milky Way is going to come in view here. And that's Jupiter. I did this a couple of couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, maybe. Oh, beautiful. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty impressive. Uh, you need to go on a raft trip with us sometime. But notice it's spinning uh, clockwise, the opposite direction. That's because I'm looking to the south. But the center of low ro rotation is below the horizon there. And uh, if you go to South Africa and do this, uh, it's, I did this in South Africa a, year and a, a little over a year ago. I was down there. And uh, everything's going to spin uh, clockwise. It's around a point to the uh, right of center above the trees. There is no south star like we have. But notice it's all wheeling around in a, clock, a counterclockwise direction. You see there are not one, but there are two points in the sky around which the stars all spin. In the northern hemisphere, it's the north celestial pole. In the southern hemisphere, it's the south celestial pole. And you can't see both of those. You'll see one or you'll see the other, unless you're right on the equator, in which case they're on the north and south horizon. And uh, so you have not one, but two points around which they spin. But you remember in the Zetetic model, the whole sky spins around one point and one point only. So how can you have two different points of rotation. You can't. But if the Earth is a globe that spins on its axis, that's exactly what you would expect. That's exactly what you will see. So, you know, a lot of these flat Earth videos are, are very slick. They, uh, they, seem to, they seem convincing to a lot of people. But when I see these things, I see numerous problems with them. And I, and I know many, many things that just simply don't work in the Zetetic model. So it's a bad argument. Did you, with your camera, when you were in the uh, planetarium, which I think is so cool to have your own uh, ability to say, hey, put a point and, and let's, let's spin some stars around so you can get one straight up from the center and then go over to the side and focus the center of the camera on that point as well to actually show that ellipse. Is that what ends up happening? Well, what I did, I didn't do the first one. I didn't, uh, I didn't think to stand at the middle and shoot that the middle. If I did, it would have been circles. Right. But, uh, but I went off to the side and did it and, and looked up and took that photograph. I can redo it if you'd like and, 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 and do center and the side if you wish. That'd be a good comparison. It occurred to me to do the first one. But I think everybody well, would agree. I just, I just don't have my own planetarium. That's yeah. all. You know, I, I'm not yeah, yeah. a Dr. Danny Faulkner. That's my problem. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do have PCC next to me. I could, you know what, you work there. So you go ahead and uh, you all make right. it happen at AIG. I think that's pretty cool. So the stars ellipses. Uh, it doesn't fit the flat Earth model or, or a version of the flat Earth model, model that they're claiming. The sunlight and the sun and the position uh, doesn't fit. Anything else that's uh, uh, just maybe one more thing that you go, hey, here's another one that just does not fit the flat Earth model and what we're actually observing today. Well, I have to think about that for a second. I'm sure I'm <laughs> there are plenty, but let me see if I can grab one real quick. Um, we had done uh, the comet one as well, uh, yeah, and how we can predict that. That denial and that's all of gravity on. on these things. Yeah, I think I think there's look the whole thing about about astronomy is is that if anybody understood anything about astronomy, uh, basics of astronomy, what I call the aspects of the skies, what you see, where you see, and all this sort of stuff, they um, they couldn't possibly believe the Earth is flat. You know, the uh, they on their model they they seem to accept latitude and longitude. Latitude is an angle measured. Uh, lunch is measured this way around this way and latitude this way. They seem to accept the reality of those things, but they have no idea how those are measured. Um, celestial navigation does not work on a, on a flat mm -hmm. earth. There is no flat earth model of celestial navigation. You can get your directions from the sky, regardless of what your model is, figure which way north or south or east, west is, and you can, you can put a bearing that you have there, but you can't tell where you are anywhere. But if you uh, have a sextant and you have a timepiece, you simply measure in rapid succession the altitude of two stars or the sun and, and a, a, a couple of times. And from that, you can calculate uh, where your latitude and longitude pretty precisely on the surface of the Earth. And indeed, that's how latitude and longitude are established. When you do surveying, you work off of benchmarks, but where do those benchmarks come from? Somebody had to actually astronomically navigate those and determine what they were. And so the moment you accept, uh, accept and by the way, it's based upon a spherical Earth. 
the whole the whole concept of latitude and longitude and, and celestial navigation to determine your latitude and longitude is based upon a spherical Earth. Flat Earthers don't seem to get this, and um, so if they want to use the 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 um, the Earth, uh, you know, latitude and longitude, they have no idea that they're what what they're borrowing from here heavily. And I've asked repeatedly from flat Earthers, hey, give me a model, give me a theory of how you can navigate. Find out where you are on the Earth with, uh, with, with celestial navigation on a flat Earth, and there is no such theory. There is no such model. It only works if the Earth is a globe. Well, this brings up, uh, in, a, in the Q&A, we've got several questions uh, coming up in the q and I'm just opening that to look at that. David asks this, if the Earth's longitudinal lines converge in the spherical model in the southern hemisphere, how do you explain the navigational errors recorded daily by the explorers of Antarctica in their uh, maritime logs, divergent lines consistent with a flat earth. Uh, that's just false. <laughs> the people in the southern hemisphere navigated by celestial navigation, and I don't know what he's talking about. They're saying there are all these navigation errors. There aren't any. Uh, flat earthers are not really good at interpreting data. One of the things they try to argue is that uh, uh, Captain James Cook you know, spent two or three years uh, circumnavigating around Antarctica and went like 70,000 miles or something, which fits in with their flat Earth model, they would say. But they, they say that it um, doesn't fit at all with the globe. Well, what they're counting is the distance he traveled. He went a total of 70,000 miles over that entire voyage over two and a half years. He had to leave England, go all the way down to the Southern Seas, and he had to come back. So they got thousands of miles added there. He spent... Uh, uh, one of those years circle, circulating around in the South Pacific. You can look at the maps of where he went. He used celestial navigation to figure out where he was. I think some of these flat earthers seem to think there's an odometer sitting on the dashboard of a ship and it just automatically you know, pegs off how many miles you're going. That's not how it works. You've got wind currents and, and, and ocean currents. You cannot figure out, unless you've got some land to look at, you can't figure out how fast you're moving. The only way you do that is you fix your latitude and longitude early in the morning or late, early in the evening, do it early in the morning again, and you check and you go day by day by day how much you, you progress. It's all based on a spherical Earth. And they, they grossly misinterpret his, his, his uh, voyage. Uh, I think it's his second voyage, I believe it was. Because again, he, he spent a year going in a big loop in the South Pacific. He wintered over in a couple of places. He made several forays down. So yeah, he traveled a total of 70,000 miles, but it was not in just one big circle around Antarctica. He was making loops and going back and forth and backtracking a lot. So uh, there were no uh, navigation errors in, uh, that, I, that I'm aware of in, uh, around Antarctica. That's a myth that flat earthers have created. That's interesting. <laughs> Peter, Peter O'Neill asked this question. He says, thanks for the web webinar. Two things. Why do flat earth proponents say the UN logo is a flat model? The UN knows the truth, it's flat. Any, any all idea on this, that one? It's all part of the, uh, <clears throat> the big conspiracy theory you have to have. Look, if the earth is flat and, and people have been keeping the secret, then the only way you can, you can maintain this story is if everybody thought the, uh, you know, that, that there's some sort of big secret, big, big conspiracy putting forth this. And of course, who better than the UN to do this? The whole point of the UN flag is it's trying to represent the entire populated part of the globe. And if you do a uh, something like a, like a, a, an equal azimuthal projection coming from the North Pole, you'll capture uh, a, most of Asia and Europe and North America pretty well. When you get into Southern Asia and into the so uh, Southern part of Africa and into South America, the distortion's bad. Australia, it's really bad. And Antarctica, you don't even want to go there. The distortion is, uh, is huge but nobody lives in Antarctica. So this is simply a representation trying to show uh, the, the entire populated part of the world and nobody seriously suggesting that, except for flat earthers, that this was any kind of admission or it was, it was a, a flat earth map. It's a, it's a representation of the populated parts of the globe. Got one more question. This will be, well, got a couple more, but this will be good. Uh... I'm disappointed, and it kind of goes into that, disappointed that you fail to support your p position with scripture. Only the flat earth model is supported by a literal interpretation of the Bible. By the way, why does NASA's website acknowledge <coughs> that its photos and videos are all CGI? Well, there's a bunch of false statements there. Number one, uh, NASA does not admit that all their images are CGI. That's nonsense. Now, what they, uh, that, that's just, again, another flat earth myth. They ask, well, you know, uh, people try to talk about these photographs from space. Let's face it, most of the photographs you see are composites put together by satellites orbiting in low Earth orbit. 
if you are um, uh, if you're standing on the surface of the ground, you can't photograph much of the Earth, be it flat or be it a sphere. You can't photograph much of it. The way to do that is to get above it and look down at it. And the higher you go, the more of it you can see. But even from low Earth orbit, a few hundred miles up, you're seeing only a little tiny part of it. So as the, as the satellite orbits around like this, it'll take a series of pictures in a strip all the way around. And then the Earth rotates its orbit precesses. They take a bunch of pictures in a strip all the way around. And then you take those thousands of pictures and you stitch them back together. It's like taking a panorama shot. If you take your cell phones, I've got this thing on my iPhone. It's got a panorama setting. And I've done that, just experimented with it recently. And what it does, is it takes a bunch of images and then stitches them together to make a single one. Now, is this CGI? Is it faking anything? Well, no, it's taking a bunch of images automatically. Before they had these things on the iPhones, you could do that if you really knew what you're doing, but it took a lot of work. It's so much easier when somebody's done the processing for you like this. <clears throat> so that's how they do those. And then there are a few images taken from farther out, like some of the Apollo astronauts, the Apollo 17, the blue, the blue marble photograph. That one, uh, they just say, well, that's fake. Well, how do you know it's fake? Well, because it's fake. You know, they, they assume that one's just not stitched together at all. It was actually taken with, a, I think, a 35 millimeter camera, film camera. Uh, we didn't have digital cameras back then, still cameras. And uh, there have been other spacecraft, but see, they just deny that. So the, uh, it's, that's simply false uh, about that. And, and then the other statement there about the Earth being a flat Earth book, that is false as well. Look, if the Bible really taught that the earth was flat, you'd think that somewhere in scripture there would be a verse that read something like this, the earth is flat. There is no such verse. Let me repeat that. There is no such verse. Instead, what people have done, what flat earthers do, is they give their own peculiar interpretation and understanding to a number of passages, and then they want to force that back onto the text and upon everybody else. And it's funny that, that nobody seemed to notice this. I've got a newsflash for you. The church, in the history of the 2,000 years history of the church, the church never taught the earth is flat. You have a hard time finding anybody in, the, in Christianity up until the 19th century who thought that. There are two examples from the late Middle Age, a late uh, ancient period who, who said that, but they were considered wackos by most people. There are a number of, uh, number of Christian sources throughout the uh, Christian age who referred to the Earth's sphericity. They accepted Aristotle's writings, for instance, and they made those arguments. It wasn't until the 19th century that a few people began saying, hey, look, the Bible teaches the Earth is flat. And some of the people who were saying that were skeptics. They were people trying to prove that the Bible was wrong. And a lot of these quotes they have, like a lot of the, a lot of the Christians, uh, flat earthers, like the, like the quote, a guy named Schadenwall, who says, it's a modern guy, he died a few years ago, he says, the earth is, is a flat earth book from beginning to end. Well, Schadenwall was a skeptic. Why are you, he didn't believe the Bible. He was trying to discredit it. Why are you quoting him on these things? So it was, it was a Robottom in the 19th century who picked this up. And I believe he was disingenuous, by the way, about this and uh, began arguing this, and unfortunately, people have followed in his wake. So, no, the Bible doesn't teach the earth is flat at all. Well, and I think that's a great point. Hannah brings up uh, a question. What about the biblical references to the pillars of the earth? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you used a term earlier about uh, reading one of those quotes about, you know, the be believing the, that everything in the Bible is literally true. I don't know anybody who believes that. I certainly don't believe, I don't think you believe that, do you, Eric? I don't believe that. <laughs> no, because, you know, uh, there, there are many idioms. There are many figures of speech in Scripture. There's some idioms and figures of speech in the first few chapters of Genesis. Uh, then later on, there, uh, Jesus used a lot of similes, and he used uh, metaphors. Uh, he used similes when he said, uh, gave the parables. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like this. He didn't say it was this, it was like this. And then he used many, many metaphors about himself. He said he was a door. He said he was the bread of life. He said he's a living water. On the night of the, of, the, uh, of the Last Supper, he said he was the vine and his disciples were the branches. Then he started talking about pruning them. I don't think anybody really believes that is literally true. When you look at the prophetic and poetic books, of which there are 17 prophetic books in the Old Testament and five poetic books in the Old Testament, and by the way, that's where many of the supposed flatter verses come from, you find all sorts of literary devices being used. You, you have, uh, if you don't, then you have to believe that uh, rivers clap their hands, so do trees. You gotta think that the things have eyes that don't have eyes and on and on and on it goes. Now, some people say, well, wait a minute. If you 
if you start saying, well, there's some things that are not literally true that are metaphorical or allegorical or, or similes, then how can you be sure about things such as the flood and the resurrection and the virgin birth and all those things? It's really quite simple. Those figures of speech, those, uh, the non literal devices I mentioned largely are absent from historical narrative. You don't, you find some idioms and figures of speech in the historical narratives, but those other devices are not there. And so when it's, when you look at the creation account, there's absolutely no reason to believe that this is an allegory, no reason to believe uh, from the text itself that it's anything but a, but a history of how God made the earth. And for other, ditto for other historical portions of scripture. So um, this, this is a false dichotomy. People saying you have to believe everything's literal. Obviously not everything's literal in the Bible. <laughs> Excuse me. Go ahead. Well, on that cough, uh, Stephanie says this, love the <laughs> photograph of Neowise. When is a good time to view the comet going forward? In the early, early morning, late evening? It will be visible in the evening sky um, starting uh, later this week, and, and there'll be, it'll be in the morning and evening sky, both for a few days, and then the uh, rest of the summer will be in the evening sky. It will be dimming as the summer progresses. Uh, you can go to several websites. My, my blog at theanswersingenesis.org has a link there to sky, a telescope that has some finder charts for people. You need a good exposure towards the um, northeast in the morning or northwest in the evening. I have to go running around looking for a place in my neighborhood because of all the trees. So go on, go back to your question you had. Yeah, and, well, and Stephanie, just so you know, I will be sending a, a, a replay of this out, and with that, I'll be sending several links uh, to his articles, and uh, one of them will be that article on that. So if you want to go to it now, go to Answers in Genesis, and go to Dr. Faulkner's blog. You can see that it's one of his recent blogs. Um, so I've heard arguments like, um, how come when, a, when an, uh, an aircraft goes into the southern hemisphere, it just disappears? You can't track it. You know, there's nothing... I'm going, I, I don't know of anywhere they don't actually track aircraft. That happens everywhere. But yeah, the, uh, the only, only place you'd have a, a blank would be <clears throat> out over the oceans. When you fly um, from uh, the United States to Europe, uh, you have to go over the Atlantic and uh, tracking is minimal there. I mean, once you leave the Canadian airspace, it's you know, Greenland or Iceland before you get to say the British Isles. So uh, there is an area there where there's very little tracking going on. Uh, in, in the, in the uh, southern oceans, there it's the southern hemisphere is like 90% water. The yeah. Pacific Ocean is huge, the, uh, and so there are there are tracks there where where uh, tracking is very minimal. There are some airports and air traffic control from some of those islands, but it's not like these planes just disappear and have no idea where they're going. <clears throat> they they do have navigation aboard. They know where they are. It used to be uh, they'd have to use radio beacons. They don't use those much anymore. They generally use GPS. I believe. And in the good old days, they probably had to use celestial navigation with a, with a sextant. That's what they did, you know, throughout the Second World War, for instance. So there, there, there's, there's not this big dead space. It's just there's places where there's very little coverage from, from ground control. Uh, let's see here. This is uh, Rob says, this is poetic. Danny and Eric, Isaiah 34.4, uh, uh, and all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll and all their holes shall fall down as the leaf falleth from the vine and as the falling fig from the fig tree. Mm -hmm. Poetic? I think not, though I know people who um, uh, think that it is. Uh, when you get into eschatological things, you have people all over the place on this. Most of the people I know uh, tend to think of these, these things we see in the heavens as being future events. Uh, but I have very good friends of mine who, who think that they are poetic. Uh, we'll, we'll find out eventually, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, I, in, in a couple of my books, I've written a couple other books. One of them is The Creative Cosmos. This one is about biblical astronomy. I've got a whole chapter on the apocalyptic things. And I went through there and I took the, that passage from Isaiah. There's one in Revelation, which is very similar to it, but has a few, few differences. And then I took a few others from the Old Testament, talks about the sun being dim, the moon being dim, the stars withdrawing their shining. And also you find Jesus uh, in the Elder Discourse talking about the, you know, quoting those as well. And I've tried to collate those and said, okay, if you look at these, each one of them from the Old and New Testament and, and even the, uh, the different accounts of those things, you end up with some, some differences and similarities. Are they talking because they, they don't totally match in every detail? Are they talking about different events? If so, you're talking about maybe a dozen different things 
I don't think so. I think it's talking about one event or series of events. And when you try to collate those, then you begin to uh, begin to find uh, how do you how do you interpret those? For instance, there in Isaiah, it's talking about the uh, stars withering uh, like like leaves. Uh, uh, and even then, it's a little tricky trying to translate that, I understand. But uh, Jesus and other, other passages talk about the sun, the stars being dimmed. Well, perhaps that message, that, that statement about the, the things withering, it's talking there about these things dimming at that point. That's the only way I can figure out how to collate these things. Uh, so it's difficult. It's tricky. But I, I tend to think those are not poetic. I think they actually will uh, future events yet to come. This is one that uh, I, I feel like I've heard many, many times, and it's the one I kind of started with at the beginning of the webinar, and this will end up being our, our last question because we're almost out of time. Uh, but Josh, uh, Josh Minson mentions, uh, how can the earth have a positive pressure atmosphere adjacent, adjacent to the infinite vacuum of space without a barrier? The idea that Boyle's Law would say that gas from the atmosphere should just dissipate into space uh, what's up with that? How, how, how is that explained? And I guess, Josh, I'm, assu I'm assuming what you're saying is that if it was a flat earth and a dome covering it, that dome is what's actually holding in the air and giving us air pressure. But go ahead, Danny. Yeah, that's one thing I didn't discuss in my book because it really wasn't an issue that I've been hit with very much. And since the book came out, I've been, I've been asked that repeatedly. So I have dealt with it in one of my articles online. If you look at the, 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 uh, the diagram there, the figure behind you, you've got the, it looks like the moon in the background, and you've got the earth sitting there, and you've got the atmosphere. So I think we, you can use that to illustrate what people are asking here. On the yeah. earth, surface of the earth, we have one atmosphere of pressure. And if you look up there much above on this diagram, you've got this vacuum of space. And they say, wait a minute, you've got, uh, you've got this zero pressure there in space. You've got one atmosphere. They're next to each other. How can that be? Because you would expect that the pressure would, would equalize and the air would just blow off the Earth's atmosphere. And that's been it become, it's become in the last year or so, a very common flat Earth argument. Again, I think you guessed it right. They would argue that if you have a dome, that's a container. They say you'll always, always, always need a container to contain this. And so whenever I've encountered this question from people, I try to ask them, I try to ask the flat Earthers, okay, tell me what mechanism would cause that to happen? And I'm trying to walk them through this. And every time, every time, 100% of the time I try to do this, they fight me the entire time. They don't want to have the discussion. So I have, to, I have to assume these people don't want an answer, all right? There is an answer, but they don't even want to go there. And part of the problem is they, they, they have a lot of misunderstandings. First of all, they think that vacuums suck. They think a vacuum just pulls everything towards it. That's not how it works at all. Vacuums don't suck. What happens is greater pressure elsewhere <clears throat> pushes the fluid, the gas as it were, from the higher pressure to a lower pressure. A pressure is a force per unit area. So if you have this surface area with you have a surface area sitting here and you've got higher pressure on one side and lower pressure on the other side, then there's a force moving across that unit, that pressure, that surface area you have there. You take that force and divide it by the area, you get pounds per square inch, or you get newtons per square meter. That are the units of pressure. So instead of, instead of things being pulled into a vacuum, things are being pushed from outside. And then the other thing I want to I clear up with them, first of all, that, that question about misunderstanding what a vacuum does or doesn't do. The other misunderstanding is that uh, uh, people uh, don't know what a vacuum is. If you ask them to define a vacuum, they'll run to the dictionary and they say, uh, total absence of any matter. Well, if that's the definition of a vacuum, then I can tell you that a vacuum doesn't exist anywhere in the universe. Nobody seriously suggests that knows anything, nobody suggests that there's a place in the universe where there's absolutely nothing. There's always something there. It may not be much, but if your definition is an absolute total absence of anything, then that doesn't exist. Actually, what a vacuum is, is a region of lower pressure. That's all it is. Um, if you go driving down the road, you remember the old days when um, you had these little small windows on your front doors? They, they took those out a long time ago. I love those in my older cars. Because the little you could, triangle uh, ones? The little triangle windows, yeah. Love those. And what you could do is you could open that up and open your floor vent. And as you drive down the highway, 
the air is moving by quickly out there and it creates a vacuum right there at the window. It's lower pressure, it's not zero pressure, but it's lower pressure. And the air inside the car pushes the air out there and you end up with this nice circulation. It's called passive ventilation. It works off this vacuum. You know, you have a chimney sitting here and you've got uh, you know, you fire going up and smoke going up the chimney. It's not the rising heat that does that. That's, that's a common misconception. It's the air blowing across the top that produces a vacuum, a low pressure there, and it forces it up there. Even if you don't have a fire at all, you will, if they have any kind of breeze, you'll have air going up that chimney uh, doing that. This is the, I, when I taught physics, that spent a whole lecture of over an hour just talking about Bernoulli's equation, all these applications. So you've got uh, lower pressure. Well, that, that you've got higher pressure, lower pressure. And so you go to the surface of the earth, you've got this high pressure sitting there, low pressure out there, and you expect that the air would just fly up. So that's what they're trying to think here. And here's the problem. Everybody knows that when you rise up in elevation in the earth, the pressure decreases. Anybody that's driven around the mountains, your ears pop all the time. You can buy a cheap barometer and drive up in the mountains, and you can see the pressure decrease. NASA, NASA is actually faking the ear popping. That, that's all. Yeah, that's it, yeah. But actually, the, the Jesuits are in charge of that. Yes, okay. And the Freemasons, right. it's not NASA this time. Anyway, I went to Pikes Peak about 15 years ago and drove up there. When I got up there, the, it was quite chilly, and, the, and, and it was, the air was hard to breathe. And I asked around for the pressure. It turns out the pressure there's only 60% of what it is where you live in Pensacola. Now, what that means is you have a vacuum up there. Remember I said a, a vacuum is actually a region of lower pressure. Right. So you have this, this, this vacuum at 14,000 feet. It's only uh, uh, six tenths of, a, of, an, of an atmosphere. As you go up through the atmosphere, I think everybody would understand this, that there is a pressure gradient. The temperature, the pressure decreases the whole time. So if their simple analysis that the flat earthers want to apply here is correct, if it's correct, then you have to explain to me why there's not all this upward rush of air from the ground upward. Because right. don't worry about the, the zero pressure above the atmosphere. There's a pressure differential all the way up. There's a pressure difference, there's a force pushing it up, they seem to think suddenly that doesn't happen until you reach zero pressure and then something magical happens. No, vacuums work at, at all sorts of pressures. If it's just a one hundredth of one atmosphere, that's a vacuum and you will get motion from the one atmosphere to the one, uh, the 99% the uh, pressure that you have. So uh, that's, that's a flaw in their analysis. It, it, whether there's a dome or not sitting over the earth, You've got a pressure differential. You've got lower pressure at high elevation, and you've got higher pressure at lower elevation. So if their if their analysis is correct, then that air ought to spontaneously rise upward, and it doesn't. Now, why is there a pressure differential? Well, it's because if you understand the physics of this, there's some sort of downward force holding the air to the earth. And we already early on in our presentation talked about what that is. It's what we call <clears throat> Gravity, the thing that flat earthers say they don't believe in, but I don't believe them when they say that because everybody understands that things fall downward. So it's, gravity is not this magical thing. It's an observational fact. Now, we can get confused about you know, what causes it and all this sort of stuff, but it is a reality that it's there, and that's what provides that countervailing force to keep pressure from driving the atmosphere upward. You know how and, atheists and liberals use arguments against uh, conservatives and creationists, and you stop and you look at their argument and you're like, wait a minute, that's an argument against your position, not my position. To me, yeah. that idea of, well, you know, if the earth had a dome, uh, you know, it should all be this, we should have all the same pressure. It can't stand next to, or they say it can't be next to the quote vacuum of space. And I go, well, this actually hurts your argument because if your argument is correct yeah. and there's a dome covering this flat earth, then all pressure, no matter what height, should be the same. Yep. When I air up my air tank uh, at my house, when I fill it up, there's not a graduation of pressure because it's in a cylinder. It can be 40 PSI at the bottom of the tank, and suppose I have a tall one, it's 40 PSI at the very top. It's the same all the way through. Even if we got gauges and put it all the way up the side of that tank, it would be the same because it's in a container. Right. So the very fact that we have graduated pressure from one atmospheric pressure all the way down to zero, the vacuum of space, that is the science that actually disproves the very thing they're trying to prove. 
exactly right. They have the same problem. If it's a problem for us, it's a problem for them. So it's a wash at best for them. It's just a wow. misunderstanding. Once again, people have been led down the primrose path to believe some things that are basically false. I thought it was because this is uh, this guy Ben is emailing me and he keeps saying, "Look, you can't have a you know a gas you know with pressure next to a vacuum." But you're right. The very definition of a vacuum. I thought that's it's not it's not once we get out there and it's zero it's going to suck all that up there because that's what they think of it as is matter of fact can i can i quote you on that sure. vacuums don't suck can I, i'm just going to tweet that from danny faulkner well actually I, I didn't originate that statement that that's been around <laughs> a long time i borrowed it so quote it away but don't attribute that's it to me because i didn't originate it, <laughs> it uh, says but they, they really statement. don't having a good understanding of that really helps you go wait a minute this this once again fits a uh well, it does not fit a, the science that we see does not fit a, uh, some kind of canopy over dome over the earth model holding the pressure. In. Yeah, that's great. Well, we didn't get time to go through uh, all the different arguments. Uh, Danny's got them all in his book. Other than that one, the gas pressure, because that wasn't written in here uh, on his book, Falling Flat. I'm going to send you an email with a coupon code where you can get, uh, I believe it's 15% off a copy of his book. I've only got a limited supply, but I will make those available to you. Uh, and then if I sell out, you can go get them from Answers in Genesis. Um, uh, I really appreciate you taking time to do this. I'd love to do another one, Dr. Faulkner, where we actually take time to go through some of these passages. Um, I know this one we kind of focused on the science of and uh, of the, the, the pros for a globe earth and the cons for a flat earth. Love to go through some of the, these scriptures that you covered and started talking about. Matter of fact, one of the questions just listed several uh, scriptures and I'd love to do that, but I am out of time for tonight. Uh, but maybe on another webinar, we could do that. Just go through all, what does the Bible say about this? And what is it really communicating to us today? I think that'd be, that'd be a lot of fun. Yep. But, uh, Dr. Wagner, thank you very much for taking the time to do this with us. I think uh, everybody got a blessing. If you, uh, if you found this interesting or fascinating, or you, uh, you thought this was an intriguing topic to, to study when there's so many people out there that are believing the flat earth, would you just raise your hand uh, if you remember how to do that? Hit the button and just raise your hand if you found it interesting. Oh, yeah. All right. Get those. Uh, there we go. Man, a lot. Of, man, we're at, uh, well, half of you have found it. Okay, a little more than half now of you guys have found this a very interesting topic. And I, and I agree. I think it really is interesting because I think God's word gives us the truth. And Dr. Faulkner, that really is, uh, I know this one was on the science, but uh, uh, I'm convinced that God's word and God's world go hand in hand. Science continually confirms what scripture says. And whether it's the, the paths of the sea, uh, how, how the, there's motion, the wind, how the, the, the sun heats up an area. Uh, so many things over and over and over confirm that God's word is true and it really should be our ultimate authority. Can you just take the last minute and just speak to that? Yes. Uh, again, it's a sh we didn't really get to the scriptural passages, but uh, we need we need to do that soon in another program. We have to come back and do it, do that one. But yeah, the 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 Christians should always base their worldview upon scripture. I believe uh, the cosmology of the Bible is a bit ambiguous. It can be read in a number of different ways, and there are reasons for that. We can talk about that more. But uh, uh, we, as a as a Christian, as a creationist, as a scientist, I always come back to scripture. I could share in a future program my, my changes and belief about cosmology. About five years ago, I completely changed my cosmology. I've been working for that, looking at that for a long time. And, and I think now I've developed, I've developed at least the basis of, a, of what I think is a true biblical cosmology. And uh, it's exciting, exciting to be, be just a part of this. Well, science does continue to confirm what God's word says. Guys, I want to thank you for joining uh, Dr. Faulkner and I tonight for this webinar. I hope you guys really, really enjoyed it. And we'd love to see you on the next one. I'll be sending an email out with several links for you, along with your coupon code to get that book, Falling Flat, uh, where you go through uh, every, a lot of the arguments uh, that flat earthers make. And I, I found it a very, very helpful book, um, especially, you know, once again, I watched some videos and if you don't know certain things, they can sound incredibly convincing. And then it just takes a little bit of science to kind of undermine the entire argument that, that's being made for a flat earth. It takes a, only a little bit of understanding of scripture to go, oh, that's what's meant there. That's the truth about it. Now I can understand that and I can move on. So I think educating yourself about this really is important. Like we said, if you're confused, you're going to lose and the people around you are going to lose but it doesn't have to be that way. You really can have answers. And that's what creation today is all about is giving you answers because someone's eternity is at stake. 
and eternity is just too long to be wrong. Dr. Faulkner, thank you again for being with me tonight. Thank you guys for joining us. We look forward to seeing you on our next webinar next Monday night, Bad Answers. Maybe I should add flat earth to the bad answers. What do you think? <laughs> oh, that's because the earth is flat. Bad answer, bad answer. But uh, next Monday night, we'll be sending emails about it. If you're on our email list, you can get that. If not, you can go to creationtoday.org forward slash sign up, creationtoday.org forward slash sign up to get our emails of when we're doing events. Awesome. Dr. Faulkner, God bless you. Have a great night. Look forward to hanging out with you sometime soon.